Great. Yeah, I always found it very nice to be uh, welcome in this uh, network uh, that organizes the schools and workshops and meetings uh, on theoretical spectroscopy. And uh, like was introduced, I'm, uh, I'm an experimentalist, so I, I do this uh, spe many spectroscopy experiments myself, uh, but I, I try to understand also a little bit of the theory. So let's see how uh, uh, how this works out. I have uh, here a, a link to a, um, a page where you could log in if you want, and there you can send uh, anonymously messages. Uh, it's a platform for for um, um, sharing your questions and comments. And I have another computer looking at that. Uh, it's a platform called Flinger, with, which we have. There's a QR code uh, linking to that as well. So, so you can, while you can, um, while you can um, um, send also questions to chat and just unmute, uh, I don't know how it works there, if you can unmute the microphone and then ask a question, uh, you can also stop me at any moment. And this Flinga link uh, is uh, there uh, presented at the, at the bottom of every slide from now on. So if you if you miss that and you want to come back to it later, it should be there. So my outline is uh, that I would start with some fundamentals such as to set the scene, what we are normally talking about. I uh, have then chosen uh, uh, to work in the linear uh, response uh, uh, scheme basically starting with a, a couple of different energy loss spectroscopies, uh, touching photo emission, and then some optical spectroscopies. And this would be the outline for this first hour. So, spectroscopy involves the study of the interaction of matter and a, uh, some kind of a probe, a wave, or a particle. And it always involves some kind of excited state, creating an excited state or watching an excited state to decay. So, uh, let me just start also a uh, some kind of pointer here. So typically we have some some kind of incoming probe, and uh, there's a there's a sample which is presented by this crystal uh, here. If uh, if uh, there, there are different possibilities that can happen if uh, the uh, the particle can be absorbed. Um, this is uh, what we are typically calling absorption spectroscopy. Uh, with the incoming probe with intensity uh, I zero and the uh, sample path length set uh, means that we have beer Lambert's law dictating how many photons or particles then actually uh, pass through the sample and then the intensity uh, decays exponentially as a function of uh, the absorbance, uh, which is uh, in optical spectroscopy is often marked with uh, uh, capital A or alpha and in X-ray spectroscopy often, often with mu. This is the function of uh, the wavelength of the energy or the energy of the particle and it's the interesting thing to measure and the path length is there as well. And then in principle, uh, even if you have a broadband white light coming in uh, or a broadband, uh, spectrally broadband uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, particles coming in, then if you monochromatize them afterwards, you can plot the spectrum. This is in optical spectroscopy even works with a, with a regular uh, prism like shown here. Also, scattering is possible. So from the diffi uh, different uh, interaction mechanisms, the probe can scatter off from the uh, sample, probably then changing of the direction uh, of the path of the particle and then one has to measure the intensity of the incoming particles there uh, usually uh, they should be monochromatic and then measuring the intensity and the uh, spectrum of the outgoing particles and here what is different now from the absorption is that there's a wave vector difference playing role here it's called the momentum transfer so if we come in with a wave vector uh, k1 and k2 there's a momentum transfer and that affects then the spectrum as you will see. So again, then one uh, is, uh, should be able to measure the spectrum of the outgoing, outgoing particles or the radiation. If the particle first absorbs, it creates an excited state and that this uh, excited state can decay. One can measure, for example, the photo emission uh, process uh, where the electron goes out of the sample or, of, or, or the excited state can decay with fluorescence uh, radiation or uh, Auger electrons. Basically, if these secondary particles are measured, uh, then we have uh, then then we do a different kind of emission spectroscopy. So, if, for example, electrons are analyzed with a uh, with an electron analyzer shown here. 
So there are various different possibilities. Uh, we can come in with different kind of particles, observe different kind of particles going out. Uh, if we have photon, in photon, out type spectroscopies, we are we have uh, uh, absorption and emission spectroscopies, uh, inelastic scattering such as Raman scattering, or inelastic X-ray scattering. Uh, this can be tuned to a resonance of a system to create resonance in inelastic scattering. If you come in with a photon and go out uh, observing an electron that is coming out, we are talking of the photo emission spectroscopy or the order electron spectroscopy. If an electron uh, goes in and electron goes out, we are using uh, typically electron energy loss spectroscopy or tunneling type experiments. And also other possibilities are, uh, are there. One can quite typically one can use also different types of uh, uh, ions, heavy and light ions, also <laughs> neutrons, and uh, uh, many of these methods can be then combined into the into the global setting of different spectroscopies. So a note on the units, typically, of course, uh, when we are working with spectroscopy, either wavelengths are and distances are nanometers or in angstroms. Energy is typically expressed in electron volts. Um, and there are a couple of useful formulas. So for photons, if you want to convert the um, corresponding wavelength to, N, to electron volts, you can use this formula where the uh, Planck's constant times speed of light turns out to be in units that if your electron, uh, if your energies are in electron volts and uh, wavelengths are in angstroms, you can convert uh, with this numerical factor. So that's, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a formula that we often use. And then of course, for particles uh, can be handled as waves uh, carrying uh, the Broglie wavelength. So, some practical aspects, uh, different particles, but if you choose an experiment, uh, you must also know uh, what are the particular features of that experiment. And one important uh, difference between different kinds of spectroscopies is, uh, is the probing depth of the, of the particles that are being used. So uh, whether we are probing a surface or the bulk, if you are really wanting to look at surface effects, you should use electrons or uh, or uh, or ions, uh, low energy ions, because they are easily uh, scattered or absorbed by the surface. Uh, the probing depth, the mean free path of these particles and materials is much less than, for example, photons. This shows um, that it's, it depends strongly on the on the specimen itself. So, if, for example, this is a, would be a sample of water. The probing depth of photons in the uh, X-ray range starts to be quite considerable, but when one uh, hits a specific absorption edge, in this case an oxygen 1s electron, it causes a strong attenuation. So um, also for neutrons, uh, the probing depth depends strongly on the, on the isotope of the, of the elements in the sample. But typically, if we are talking of photons or X-rays, they, they uh, penetrate deep into the materials, they are bulk sensitive and electrons typically uh, tend to be very surface sensitive compared to that. Then this is a, a, quite a typical image. If you would think of an electron probe, you have a primary electron beam hitting a surface of the sample. What kind of things happen? There are many, many different interaction processes. One can uh, have the scattered or secondary electrons coming from the nanometer range. Uh, Osher electrons comes from a few uh, Ongstrom's uh, analy uh, analysis depth. But then if you are exciting with electrons, but then uh, looking X-rays coming out, the analysis depth is uh, in the range of micrometers because then the X-rays can be escaped from this interaction volume also in deeper in the system. So different combinations are possible. But this is just something to bear in mind when planning an experiment in order to choose which probes to use. But OK, um, so the interaction fundamentally is driven by the uh, interaction Hamiltonian. And uh, if we look at the photon electron interaction, we can um, we can uh, use the so-called minimal substitution in which uh, we take um, the momentum of the electron uh, to be replaced by something that contains the vector field potential of the of the photon field, the capital A. So this means that the Hamiltonian for the kinetic energy of uh, the electron gets two new terms. 
uh, squaring this in the uh, in the kinetic energy term uh, gives you um, new terms of uh, that uh, are related to the a squared and then uh, the dot product between the a and the electron momentum so now if we look at the um, transition rate it looks uh, to the second order like this we have a first order transitions from a state a that could be uh, that could be the crown state of a system and then b which is uh, the excited uh, state the transition rate has the first order term second order term also uh, possibly higher order terms uh, but if you plug this uh, interaction hamiltonian here you can see that in in the end uh, this eight squared term uh, plugged into the first order causes scattering it turns out that uh, in this case the photon number doesn't change so that you come in with one photon and go out with one photon so that describes scattering if you plug in the a dot p term into the first order it turns out that the photon number changes by one so that that, that describes either absorption or emission of a photon and then uh, if you plug in the p dot a term into the second order uh, you get resonance scattering, which uh, has uh, uh, intermediate states. There is a possibility for the first state, initial state, to, uh, to evolve into an intermediate state, which uh, uh, is at, uh, as, as, at, at uh, resonance, so that uh, when the intermediate state decays into the final state, you get the resonant term here, and this, this term can actually uh, then strongly enhance uh, the cross-section uh, of the second order it can become larger than the first order. So this term, term describes resonance scattering, also resonance Raman scattering. So in principle one then constructs the set of initial states. If you have a deep uh, crown state, uh, that would be your initial state. If you have several crown states that are close to each other in energy so that thermal excitations can eat, uh, occupy them, then you have to uh, average over them waiting with a Boltzmann distribution or something like this. And then uh, you sum over the, all the possible final states and then you can get your get your uh, cross section, which is the measure of the scattering length. And the total cross section is measured in uh, barns, the unit of uh, normally for, for the uh, atomic uh, spectroscopies. Uh, uh, this is a very small number, so it's useful to uh, change the unit to a barn. Uh, why barn? Uh, because it was sometime in the Cold War when uh, the uh, probability for uh, uh, for the fission uh, uh, to, to happen uh, due to a, a neutron uh, hitting a uranium target, uranium nucleus, um, uh, somebody said that it's very difficult because uh, the uranium nucleus is, is so small, but uh, then somebody argued that, look, it's big as a barn and you cannot hit it, you cannot, cannot miss it, so you, you, you will hit it. Uh, the cross section is 10 to minus, 20, uh, 10 to minus uh, 24 uh, square centimeters, and it's large enough for all our uh, scattering experiments to, and, and absorption experiments and uh, so on to actually work out. So the differential, uh, there's a, uh, two modifications to the total cross section. There's a differential cross section that measures the probability for a particle to be scattered into a certain solid angle element. So uh, you have a incoming wave field. Uh, it interacts with the scattering object, and then there is a certain solid angle element into a certain direction. Uh, and then you count how many, uh, how, what is the number density of uh, of the particles that get scattered into that volume uh, solid angle element? So now, and then uh, when doing spectroscopy, it's important to add also another uh, differential part here. So now uh, this is the doubly differential cross section that also includes the energy range. So now there's a probability for a particle to be scattered into the solid angle element, also having a frequency in the given interval. Uh, in this case, um, between omega 2 and omega 2 plus t omega 2. So this is then what is basically being measured and in ideally something that uh, should be calculated. When you go into the calculation, then you have to plug in uh, the, your interaction Hamiltonian. And if you have this in the for the photon field, uh, recall that then the photon field can uh, is described by uh, the pe pe uh, periodic uh, electromagnetic wave with a wave vector uh, k and frequency omega. 
And uh, for the vector potential, one would take a superposition of all the modes, uh, K and polarization modes. But what is important here is that you do have the, um, you have the polarization factor for the photon field. And then uh, this uh, exponential that basically contains then the location uh, of the of the electron in the system, the size of the system, and the uh, wave vector. If the wave vector is uh, very small, uh, uh, then uh, basically basically in the, uh, we can approximate this term to be uh, so small in the exponential that the whole uh, exponential is one. And this brings us the dipole approximation. So uh, everything else goes out, and what we are left is with the is uh, with the polarization uh, vector uh, interacting with the uh, position vector of the electron. And this uh, this eventually is the transition rate that gives rise to the absorption and, and, and the emission spectroscopies. And in scattering, something similar happens. I would like to keep here, uh, not uh, going into the dipole approximation, but to retain that the transition matrix operator is an exponential. It contains the K vector of the incoming minus the K vector of the outgoing beam. So uh, it uh, turns out that there's the Q vector, the scattering vector, uh, that uh, also can induce uh, no uh, non-dipolar, uh, let's say, uh, excitations, not only in the dipole approximation. And this gives rise to the Raman scattering or inelastic X-ray scattering. That was for the photons. But if we go for electrons, uh, the interaction with the electrons uh, of the probe uh, with the, uh, and the interaction of the and the electrons in the material is described by the electron electron uh, Hamiltonian. And it has the same type of, of exponential of Q dot R, which can be brought into the dipole limit by approximating that it's just Q dot R. But it importantly has also uh, in the Denmont nominator a uh, additional factor Q squared. So this means that compared to uh, photon electron interaction in the photon electron scattering, the electron electron scattering has a strong enhancement at when you go to very low values of Q, so forward scattering. And this is the uh, interaction that gives rise to electron energy loss spectroscopy. So in an electron energy loss spectrometer, you have an electron gun. Uh, uh, your electron optics, uh, basically electromagnetic uh, el electric field um, uh, optics, and then a sample in transmission, and then you measure the energy of the outgoing electrons, which uh, then interact with the sample and, and, and create excitations, creating energy losses. So this is, uh, can be combined, for example, this scanning transmission electron microscope. So Typical quantities that then one has to consider when calculating quantities, measuring them. Uh, we have the macroscopic dielectric function, which has uh, which is a complex quantity and it uh, has a, so a real and imaginary part, and then it uh, is a function of energy and momentum in in, in principle. So in the optical uh, light region, uh, optical absorption one of the, often forgets the Q dependence here and just uh, calculates the omega dependence. But bear in mind that that is there. Uh, the refractive index can be calculated from the dielectric function. It also has uh, uh, um, a real and imaginary parts. Uh, all the optical properties basically come from their reflectivities. Uh, absorption coefficient is purely related to the imaginary part. Uh, of the refractive index, which co causes then attenuation, and this is the uh, absorption coefficient. Um, loss function, which is measured in electron energy loss spectroscopy and inelastic X ray scattering. The spectral density function, which is measured in photo emission spectroscopy. And then the loss function is also uh, related to the Fourier transform of the density density correlation function. Okay, so. This is the basic outsetting. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Good moment to break for a question or two. Yeah, Simon. Yeah. Uh, I have one um, question when you show, I don't know if you get back to it for the resonant uh, uh, formula, which you shown just before talking about cross section. Yes, here. Um, how comes that 
what I would naively put into the denominator of the resonant term would be also a dependence on the uh, intermediate energy, the, interme the energy of the intermediate state. Instead, I have still A and B. Ah, sorry, there's, yeah, there's a mistake, actually. Yeah, it should be the, uh, of course, sorry. Uh, it should be the intermediate state energy. So the resonance is created by the absorption of a uh, particle from uh, to the excitation from the state A to the state N. There are actually two terms which uh, comes up. There's one which is uh, I have to correct this for the for the final slides uh, that I could send you. Uh, there are actually two terms uh, that come in because you cannot actually tell the um, quantum mechanically you cannot say in which order things happen so there's also a term that basically emits a, a, a resonance uh, in, in the resonance process a photon before the first one is absorbed and then you have another one which is the where normally uh, one has uh, uh, absorption of a photon and then uh, the emission of the resonantly uh, uh, emission of the resonant emission photon but i have skipped uh, one term sorry about this okay. i have to fix this Good point. There is another question. Uh, yep. Questions? Yes. But no, that's the um, You know, when you're talking about spectroscopy for material, yes, not through molecular spectroscopy. And also, you talked about tunneling when you probe an electron and you get an electron, yes. Tunneling through spectroscopy. Is it happening for spectroscopy through materials or molecular spectroscopy? I mean, can you a little bit explain that? Um, not sure if I can hear you properly. Uh, you are talking of uh, the tunneling spectroscopy. Uh, yes. Uh, the scanning, uh, the tunneling spectroscopy is typically used for a um, uh, for for. Uh, especially uh, strongly correlated materials, uh, solid state materials, uh, where one can get a basically topographic images of surfaces. Uh, and uh, I'm not exactly sure can, if you can repeat your question. Okay, so you... you see tunneling through materials, not molecules, yes. I mean, materials, yes. What exactly do you get from these types of spectroscopy, for example, as an example? Well, for example, yeah, if uh, for uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy is uh, is is, an, uh, is is one uh, example where you measure the density of electrons in a, in a sample as a function of their energy. So you can uh, probe basically the uh, uh, density of states uh, and get also uh, topological uh, images of a, of a sample surface. One can, for example, observe uh, things like uh, um, stripes in, uh, in, 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 in superconductors. And there is another question from the the OG spectroscopy you said. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish between the, let's say, normally scattered electrons and uh, the OG electrons? The Auger electrons have characteristic uh, frequency <laughs> energies, like uh, it's, it's a competitive process for fluorescence. Uh, you can, uh, if you create a core hole in a system, it can decay, and uh, then uh, pro pro probability for uh, this decay to take place through a radiative or non-radiative process uh, then dictates whether a fluorescence photon comes out or an Auger electron comes out. So the Auger electron uh, is basically there's a there's a virtual photon that first uh, is emitted by the uh, decay and then is absorbed by again an outer uh, shell electron which is then emitted. And these uh, Auger electrons have characteristic energies like the fluorescence light. Okay, so, so that, does that mean that you need some prior knowledge about in which energy window you should look into? Well, in principle, yes. Okay, thank you. But, okay, yeah, Auger electron spectroscopy is more common when, I mean, let's, let's go here. 
So what you do here is to, to come in with a photon, right? And then, uh, then um, uh, in the in the Auger process, you come go out with an electron. So there's no electron coming in, if that's what you mean. Auger spectroscopy is quite commonly used in uh, gas phase systems, molecular uh, low density matter. Okay. Uh, also specifically because Auger, the Auger process is dominant in, in light uh, atoms, low atomic number atoms, uh, while fluorescence uh, dominates in heavier elements. It dep depends basically on the transition energy. Low uh, transition energies are more typical to be decayed by Auger than, uh, than heavier. So when you go to stronger, uh, let's say, strongly correlated materials or, or, or heavier uh, elements, you would then uh, normally uh, look at the emission of a photon rather than an electron in this okay. sense. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, there's nothing in the Flinger, so remember also this Flinger link. Um, now, for the energy loss spectroscopies, we have, have a group here too that are very similar in, in a way, but differ in, in uh, several practical matters. We can, can come in with an electron, uh, which interacts with the system, loses energy to create an excitation in, uh, in a sample, and then emerges with a, a lower energy than the incoming uh, electron and with a different direction. So it changes the momentum. Uh, as well. Also the magnitude and the direction of the momentum can change. And there's a momentum transfer involved, which you can calculate and uh, approximate from uh, this kind of kinematics. And typically this uh, uh, important factor, the scattering angle here is in EOS called uh, with a phi. And there's an energy transfer. So this energy transfer is now the energy of the excitation created in the system. Uh, you can do very similar things with uh, photons, and in which case it's called uh, inelastic X-ray scattering, and uh, you can add uh, non-resonant in the uh, beginning, just to emphasize that it is not resonant, resonance uh, scattering. You come in with a photon instead of an electron, and then go out with the photon. It's actually a different photon, so you destroy a photon here and then emit a new photon, but uh, uh, we still call it uh, scattering. And, and in this case, the scattering angle often is called two theta, and then you can get the momentum transfer uh, for the photon uh, scattering from this kind of formula. So the measured quantity here is the loss function that is readily calculated by, uh, for example, the DP code. Uh, hopefully you will uh, do some calculations with that. Um, equivalently, um, especially in EELS, uh, people always uh, talk about the loss function uh, in inelastic X-ray scattering. It's basically the same function that is measured, you multiply it by Q, uh, Q squared, and then you have something which is uh, called uh, the dynamic structure factor of S of Q and omega. Here you have a normalization factor, including the electron density. So uh, these are the functions measured by by these techniques and what you can find out is that uh, you have uh, typically this kind of low loss uh, valence uh, electron uh, and other uh, low energy loss uh, excitations and then higher energies uh, energy transfers uh, with a core uh, loss region so this contain in the low loss region you always have some kind of zero loss peak in the experiment uh, uh, due to elastic scattering, but then when you go to the inelastic scattering, uh, you can excite pho phonons or molecular vibrations. Uh, you can uh, see uh, excitons if you have a band cap uh, material, a semiconductor with a band cap or insulator. You can get uh, plasmons, uh, bulk plasmons, and surface plasmons. Uh, and then when you go to higher uh, energy losses, you can see core. Uh, in electron excitation. So from inner bound core electron orbitals to unoccupied electron states. So uh, this is what one, one could, for example, ex uh, expect. Uh, what are these plasmons? Um, typically what you would uh, 
do would uh, to be to take a simple metal for as a first example like uh, aluminum or then a silicon for example uh, a semiconductor you would anyway get something uh, similar as here this is for the truths model the dielectric function uh, can be uh, can be uh, uh, deduced to be of this form you have a uh, one minus uh, uh, the um, <laughs> something which is called the plasmon energy divided by then the uh, energy squared plus then the term that uh, in, uh, causes dampening with the lifetime and uh, measuring this um, would end up uh, seeing in the loss function a peak at the plasmon energy which is defined here the plasmon energy is the part where the dielectric function uh, cross uh, the real part crosses zero from uh, from uh, negative values to positive values and when the imaginary part is small enough and this creates then a strong peak in the loss function. Uh, now things change when you change the um, uh, momentum transfer which is not explicit here this um, uh, when you in eels and in uh, inelastic excess scattering you can tune the momentum transfer and what happens is that uh, with higher momentum transfers, first of all, the loss function peak uh, increases in, in the energy and then uh, it gets dampened at a certain point when the, when the zero crossing uh, is uh, no longer there in the real part and the imaginary part is large, then uh, you will just get the uh, broad continuum of excitations, electron hole pair uh, continuum instead of uh, the plasmon. What is the plasmon? If you think of, uh, in a bulk sense, a piece of metal that consists of uh, freely moving electrons and then the positive ion cores. If you put this to an external electric field, the electrons will feel uh, a force and they will, the macrosco even macroscopic uh, uh, sample can get a, a polarization because of that. And if you remove the electric field, then uh, the situation will go back to normal, but there's a pendulum effect because the electrons have a have a uh, mass and, and so basically this uh, pendulum <laughs> classical example of a pendulum in this case uh, has a certain frequency and that in the metal is called the plasmon frequency and that's what you will see in the loss function. The plasmon has a strong influence on the optical properties. Uh, you will uh, have a um, basically uh, for frequencies uh, electromagnetic wave frequencies below the plasmon frequency you will the the electrons in the ma metal can screen this uh, uh, screen the electromagnetic wave from from entering the metal and there's a total reflection but above the plasma frequency these plasmons can be excited and because of that there's a partial transmission and that happens exactly at the plasmon frequency that means that if you calculate from the uh, index of refraction, the reflectivity, you will see that for a, uh, uh, for the Struts model uh, metal, you will have a perfect 100% uh, reflectivity until the plasma energy, which is in the case of uh, aluminum uh, 15 electron volts or so. Also in silicon, it's very close to 15 electron volts. So in principle, this um, for, for the pure metal uh, explains why metals are shiny. So this uh, Spectra change drastically when you uh, increase the momentum transfer. You get uh, you get this plasmon spectrum at the uh, low uh, momentum transfer here, low uh, momentum transfer in atomic units and inverse Ångströms. And then uh, this is an old paper uh, together with the uh, ETSF Palazzo group where they calculated then the response function uh, with different models using uh, uh, Chelium model, uh, homogeneous electron gas model in the random phase approximation, then going to the real metal. Uh, and this was sodium. Even sodium as a simple metal already uh, shows that this is uh, not necessarily a uh, trivial problem to solve. But nowadays, of course, uh, of course, uh, this this is now known, and one can one can uh, st study then more interesting materials. Uh, but this was also already an important benchmark. So the plasmon energy is related to the electron density. This means that if you have different kind of electron systems, then you have a layer two D system that might have sigma and pi charge carriers, then they might have different uh, plasmons, and also surface plasmons exist. And this gives rise to the plasmonics, which is the uh, interaction with the electromagnetic radiation and the, and the plasma in the uh, plasmon excitations in, in the materials. Anyway, so the 
eels uh, experiments can be combined in a, in an electron microscope, uh, but inelastic X-ray scattering experiments are typically done at synchrotron light sources because of the need for the extreme uh, uh, brilliance of uh, of uh, light. So these are usually uh, large facilities. Um, there's one in Switzerland, the Swiss light source, for example, and then some of the largest uh, uh, synchrotron facilities are shown here. It consists of uh, basically the idea is to accelerate electrons into uh, uh, to circulate in the storage ring, trying to keep them as stable as possible, and then due to the uh, interaction with the magnets in the storage ring, they emit very strong uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, in the depending on the on the storage ring from an inf infrared to x-ray, uh, very hard x-ray ranges. So, okay, I have to move on. I show just here a, a typical inelastic x-ray scattering beam line. You have a radiation, the light from the synchrotron radiation source, you monochromatize it and focus it and hit it with a, uh, to a sample, and then you have a specific spectrometer that again selects the wavelength of the uh, of the uh, outgoing light that has uh, interacted with uh, with the system, and uh, then focuses on the de detector. And by choosing the uh, scattering angle, one can tune the momentum transfer. But okay. Uh, Going back to the uh, loss function, if we look at the uh, core loss region, we see these core excitations here. And these are really uh, excitations from uh, the deeper core levels, like uh, in this case, uh, we show some molecules uh, that contain uh, carbon and one uh, is tuning then the uh, incoming uh, X-ray uh, basically can be at, uh, or uh, the electron energy is, is not important. What is important is the energy transfer in the system. So when you, when you go out with a with a, a photon or the electron, if the energy transfer corresponds to uh, the energy of the uh, of the diff energy difference between the one S core level and then the unoccupied states, one can measure the unoccupied states, and this is a, a clear fingerprint then for different different molecules and different materials. So this is uh, uh, known as uh, uh, in the electron energy loss world, also as the electron energy loss near edge spectroscopy, LNES for short, and in IXS, it's known as the X-ray Raman scattering spectroscopy. So they are database for core loss, core, uh, loss spectra. And uh, just to keep in mind that when you're talking of eels, you have to specify whether we are talking of the core losses in the LNES or then the valence, uh, the low loss part of uh, eels because they are typically then um, uh, treated somehow uh, separately even if they are part of the same uh, loss function. Okay, any questions concerning that part? Um, Advantages and disadvantages of one or the other, if you mean the, um, between the IXS and eels. Uh, eels, uh, like electrons, they are very, it's very surface sensitive. So uh, if one is interested in, in surfaces, or at least the samples must be extremely carefully prepared so that they, uh, in, in transmission, you can only have very thin samples, very thin films. Uh, the energy loss, um, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy is very sensitive to the low momentum transfer signals because of this uh, factor in the uh, Hamiltonian. So, uh, for example, what happens, this is an inelastic X-ray scattering data. Eels would be very strongly measuring this uh, low momentum loss uh, signal, but it would have uh, difficulties measuring the high momentum loss signals because uh, it's more probable that that the uh, outgoing measured electron has actually undergone several uh, low loss, uh, low momentum loss events, and then uh, this causes multiple scattering. While in uh, inelastic X-ray scattering, the scattering cross section is so it's actually uh, so uh, low that uh, we can safely assume that there's only one single scattering event taking place. Uh, again, IXS uh, is not surf sensitive to the to the surfaces. The eels needs a vacuum environment, uh, while the IXS can be done for 
for um, samples also in complex sample environments sandwiched between between uh, like uh, you can build a uh, battery cell working battery cell and measure uh, the, the, the IXS signal through that while EELS cannot do that because it's readily absorbed by the sample environment. But in principle, it's the same same function with these uh, constraints. And Simon, and to continue yes. this, uh, the resolutions, because for example, I remember that when we did the, the inelastic stress scattering for silicon, um, we were exploring large momentum transfer, and we had a very high momentum uh, resolution in the higher range. But for example, uh, talking with the um, uh, experimentalists doing uh, electron energy loss, they are very, uh, let's say, spatially resoluted very often, but not so momentum re resolved. The momentum resolution is not uh, is not uh, always their uh, their, uh, their strength. Uh, no, I mean, EELS uh, generally has better resolution in many aspects. It's uh, uh, like you say, especially uh, one can fo uh, focus electrons in principle into a uh, single atom. Uh, so this is a very useful aspect. In uh, the case of, uh, of energy resolution, also electrons are, uh, because of the, the strong coupling to the electrostatic uh, uh, optical systems can, can be monochromatized uh, very well. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult with hard X-rays to uh, to achieve uh, such a focusing and uh, and uh, and energy resolution. Uh, in the case of a momentum transfer, it's true that uh, in in IXS for high momentum transfers, it's easier to achieve some kind of uh, momentum resolution because uh, again, this multiple scattering events basically affect uh, strongly the uh, ability for the e electron energy loss uh, to to probe the the high uh, momentum transfer region. Okay, thank you. Especially if one is looking at very low losses, like um, uh, some of the plasmons in superconductors that are in uh, less than electron volt range, it's uh, possible to easier to do that with eels because the inelastic signal uh, is, is stronger and in inelastic X-ray scattering, the inelastic signal uh, becomes uh, uh, actually it's, it's increasing with the increasing momentum transfer and these uh, plasmons that, uh, that are, 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 are very low energies, they uh, tend to exist that uh, they tend to have a very low uh, critical cutoff mo momenta. So this is the momentum where the plasmon decays into the electron hole uh, continuum, right? So that then one must organize an experiment with very high energy resolution with very uh, at very low momentum transfers, and there that's where EELS is better in doing. Okay. Okay. Uh, photo emission spectroscopy uh, (PES) for photo emission or photo electron spectroscopy. XPS, especially in case if core levels are probed, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, one can excite with ultraviolet uh, for UPS, and then uh, especially interesting is angular result photo emission spectroscopy. Uh, so this is based on uh, uh, coming in with a photon, so like the names imply, either from uh, from ultraviolet range to X-ray range, um, and then. Uh, uh, Measuring the electrons that come out of the sample surface, it's very surface sensitive, only a few atomic layers because of the electrons only can escape uh, that uh, thickness. And it measures the occupied uh, density of states, removing an electron. And in, in, in angular resolved uh, photo emission, one can map the band structure of uh, crystalline solids and, 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 and uh, study the kind of quasi particle dynamics in also in strongly correlated materials. So this this shows uh, basically set up uh, in, in a case when you need uh, ultraviolet or, or X-rays, uh, the source to use is a synchrotron. So again, you have a synchrotron beam line that prepare, prepares the photons that are coming in the sample. And now in this uh, schematic, one can now uh, 
probe the different uh, uh, in-plane momentum component of the el uh, electrons uh, before the, they get excited. So one uh, first creates a core hole. This electron uh, that leaves the core hole must first escape to the surface uh, from the atom and then, uh, then go, go to the barrier through the surface. So, the, so that work needed for that is called the work function. And it's here written with a phi. And then the binding energy, uh, we can calculate uh, what the electron had in the, in the, in the, when it was in the system is the incoming photon energy minus the work function minus then the measured kinetic energy. So which is then uh, observed at the, at the electron analyzer. And one can with this way map uh, on uh, 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 position sensitive detector two dimensions with one dimensions, you have the uh, energy of the electron in one dimension, you have a moment, one uh, component of the momentum. So uh, these kind of modern uh, electron analyzers are extremely efficient because they can do this kind of mapping uh, on, on, a, on a, basically on a camera, you can see uh, the film of your electrons are like on TV screen. So um, this uh, band mapping allows one to look at uh, Fermi surfaces, band dispersion, and then from the line shape uh, and, and, and uh, finer uh, parameters of the spectra, also the self energies and Green's function. So because everything has to be done in vacuum, they look uh, a bit more like this. There's always this hemispherical analyzer somehow involved. Uh, in reality, you see often if you go to a place like that, it's covered uh, everywhere with aluminum wrapping because of uh, the because of the uh, bake out of the vacuum system is done so that there is a there are heating lines here under the underneath, and uh, in order to achieve the high vacuum, one must uh, heat heat the system up before before the experiment in order to get rid of all the dirt. So. In this case, the measured function is the spectral density function, which is the one electron uh, removal spectrum of a, in, a, in a crystal. So it would look like for the band structure mapping like this, that you have an, uh, in a non-interacting electron system where you have a band uh, uh, crossing a Fermi surface like this as a function of uh, electron momentum and energy. You would see then sharp line in uh, that that is a spectral density function uh, for the occupied states and for the unoccupied states. But in reality, when the uh, uh, electron system, uh, the electrons are interacting, you go to a real Fermi liquid system. This gets uh, smeared out uh, so that you get the coherent and incoherent peak in the uh, spe spectral density function, and the, then the magnitude of this coherent peak, uh, how much it drops, is uh, related to something we call the quasi-particle renormal normalization factor and in order to do this properly then one has to go uh, into the uh, real calculation uh, for the real interacting system and um, that's where all the theory, theory uh, is, is needed and you can imagine that for example for a strongly correlated systems then this quasi-particle uh, we cannot call it any more particle this quasi-particle effects uh, uh, become important in order to in order to map the map the uh, uh, system and understand the dynamics, but this very uh, uh, beautiful probe for the uh, band uh, bands and, and Fermi surfaces, even in uh, single layer systems, the uh, single layer graphene shows this Dirac, very nice Dirac fermions. Uh, you know, this uh, linear dispersion of uh, the electron bands near the Fermi level at uh, one specific uh, K point of the uh, of the brilliant zone. And you, you get this Dirac, Dirac cone because of this, uh, of this linear dispersion. So one can see already from a single layer of graphene, one can get very nice, nice band structure information. And then when you go to strongly correlated systems, interesting things are what happens in superconductors when they are cooled below the superconducting state and a gap forms at the Fermi level in the superconducting state. And, and, and this, uh, this is uh, now uh, quite uh, quite important topic in in the study of these compli more complicated materials. There's also the inverse photoemission, which means that in a photoemission where you remove an uh, electron from an occupied state and you are measuring then the occupied states uh, K and energy resolved. Um, in inverse photoemission, you come in with, to the sample with an electron, and then it emits a photon. And uh, this uh, then measures uh, the same for the unoccupied states. And combining these is uh, another powerful uh, probe for measuring the full uh, band structure for both uh, below and above the Fermi level. 
So this is, for, for example, an old but famous example of measuring the band cap of nickel oxide, the prototypical strongly correlated material that according to band structure calculations should be a metal, but it has instead of four electron volt band cap uh, combining uh, em uh, photo emission and, and inverse photo emission spectroscopy. So, yeah, it's called Brehm Strahlung because Brehm Strahlung means the breaking radiation. And what is typically happening when you uh, hit an elec uh, electron into a target, it, uh, it, it emits radiation anyway due to the Brehm Strahlung. But now you get uh, modification of the Brehm Strahlung spectrum because of the density of states. And uh, one can combine this with time result uh, methods. You can uh, induce, for example, uh, another pump which excites the system. Uh, and then probing this uh, with, uh, with ARPES uh, is a very nice tool for doing uh, uh, measurements on light-induced dynamics in systems or relaxation processes and other non-equilibrium electron uh, processes, including electron-electron uh, interaction. So this is, a, uh, this is another interesting field, more about the time, time result experiments later, probably. Okay. Is it possible to have plasmonic effects on molecules or only in metals? Can we calculate this effect? So the plasmon is a uh, charge density uh, wave, charge density oscillation. Typically in molecules, uh, they are dominated by the fact that you have uh, uh, kind of discrete energy intervals and the spectra are con consisting of uh, the molecular uh, orbital uh, excitation. So the, you don't really have uh, plasmons in individual molecules. Uh, when you put molecules to form a condensed uh, state system, uh, molecular crystal or, or, or something like this, then these molecular excitations start combining with, uh, with the possibility to have a plasmon. So the plasmon needs needs a more macroscopic uh, bulk uh, in order to be, uh, to be present. So you, have, you can do that in nanoparticles. Plasmonics in nanoparticles is an, is an active topic for many spectroscopies, but these are still uh, nanoparticles in a way that they are, they are bigger than molecules. So I'm not aware of any uh, plasmons in, in individual uh, single isolated molecules. Okay, let's go uh, for the last thing. I just wanted to show also the uh, other uh, the optical um, spectroscopies. Uh, many optical spectroscopies are a little bit easier than uh, electrons and uh, and uh, X-ray spectroscopies because of the light sources are a little bit easier to organize. So and they don't need ultra high vacuum like electrons. So a typical. Uh, optical uh, UVV ultraviolet visible light spectrometer would work so that you have a source of light. Uh, typically, a couple of different lights are uh, light uh, sources are needed to cover the entire spectral region from ultraviolet to visible. Um, so you might need to change the light source when you change the, uh, the wavelength, but then you have a, some kind of dispersion device. It can be a prism or a, or, uh, or a uh, uh, grating. Uh, where you then choose with a slit uh, certain wavelength that you want to get out and then it goes through the sample and you measure uh, the transmitted uh, light with a detector. And now you have the beer lamberts law, which says that the absorbance is related to the logarithm of the incident uh, uh, intensity versus the transmitted intensity. And there from, especially with, if you're dealing with optical uh, mm -hmm. spectroscopy in molecules, we have a uh, we break this out to um, the absorbance into concentration times the part length times the then the absorption spectrum, which is here with epsilon. So if you want to go to vacuum ultraviolet and X-ray range, you need synchrotrons. But if you are working in uh, in a lower ultraviolet uh, and uh, and a visible light range, the uh, instruments can be miniaturized uh, into these tabletop si systems where light sources exist. So these are powerful tools to identify molecules uh, also in solution, but also to study in solid state band caps and defect states in solid state. This is, a, for example, some a study from uh, uh, Patrick Rinke and co-workers where they uh, studied the uh, oxygen uh, um, 
vacancies in, in uh, magnesium oxide. These uh, tend to be uh, impurities that occur between the, uh, in energetically between the valence and conduction band. And uh, one can uh, pinpoint uh, selectively then uh, what, uh, oxygen what kind of oxygen vacancies one has, and then comparing then to the optical absorption, which is then strong because of these vacancies inside the band cap uh, is, uh, is, is, a, is a nice tool for, for uh, analyzing uh, defects in, in these uh, structures. And one can combine that with, uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, different kind of polarization. We know that certain materials are then optically active uh, for circularly or elliptically polarized light. And uh, this is typical method uh, called circular dichroism, measures the difference in the absorption between light, left and right-handed circularly polarized light. And this is an uh, effect that has, uh, uh, has an important uh, role in uh, studies of chiral molecules because it probes the secondary structure, the helices and so on of, uh, of these uh, large uh, molecules such as proteins, uh, which have different, uh, different uh, left and right handed optical activity. In principle, the same experiment, but you have another uh, optical element to change the polarization of a light. So, Again, uh, well, then understanding the uh, circular dichroism spectrum needs some uh, information. Uh, if you have a secondary structure of optically active molecule, uh, it will have a unique fingerprint in the spectrum. And then one can uh, uh, use a, a especially theoretical spectroscopy in order to model the spectrum uh, to then find out more information on the, on the structure of the uh, molecule. Um, but you can, one can use this for time re resolved studies uh, for excited states in molecules. And then again, uh, needs a synchrotron if one uh, wants to go to the vacuum ultraviolet range, but uh, traditional ultraviolet lamps in laboratory e equipment are possible as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, well, the last thing I wanted to mention, sometimes you might encounter only optical ellipsometry. It's uh, especially used for thin films uh, grown on a substrate uh, to, method, uh, to investigate the refractive index. And uh, in an ellipsometry experiment, you have your thin film uh, sample and uh, light, monochromatized light, which, uh, uh, which then you uh, measure the polarization of the, of the light. And then uh, basically by measuring the reflectivity, difference between an S and P polarized light uh, by rotating the sample and doing this experiment measuring the uh, ratio can be related to the amplitude ratio and the phase difference upon the reflect reflection from the surface. And uh, now uh, this uh, can be then back calculated, uh, basically calculating the Fresnel equations for this kind of system uh, to characterize the optical property of the thin film. And then the, also you get information on the, on the roughness and the thickness of the film. But uh, ideally from these measured values, uh, and constructing optical model, some kind of uh, start with some kind of uh, uh, ideal guess what uh, your system is like, you can then deduce the complex dielectric func uh, constant, absorption coefficient, and then it brings this in the optical uh, range, so only at uh, zero momentum transfer. Okay, uh, that was, uh, I would like to talk to you about many more other techniques and, uh, and the details, but now I'm running out of time, so I have to stop. So I will just uh, use this as my last slide and uh, thank you. Um, there's one question in Flinga. Uh, inverse photo emission can also be angle result. Yes, in principle, the same quantum numbers can be extracted. Uh, energy and the momentum uh, also in principle spin uh, uh, result. Yeah, but we see we see less, uh, let's say we see less literature on the inverse photoemission, right? Mm. Rather than the direct photoemission. Yeah, uh, direct photoemission is more mainstream. 
So this means that you have uh, equipment readily. Uh, you can purchase them from the shelf of, uh, of uh, <laughs> if you find a correct supermarket, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, IPES instruments are much more rare. This is true. Okay. Okay, and uh, I have um, uh, a question about the optical uh, spectroscopy. Uh, you 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 showed now in the last slide with the lipsometry that indeed you have uh, uh, both the real and imaginary part, right, at the same time. In, in, in principle, yes. It means. Uh, not directly from the experiment. From the experiment, you measure this amplitude ratio and the phase difference, but then uh, you construct a model yes. uh, which you use to fit then uh, the parameters and the eventually the, the best fit gives you the uh, the uh, the uh, complex refractive index. So this has the advantage of measuring in principle or, or yielding the information of both of them separately, while as if you measure um, similar things in uh, absorption or eels or IXS, uh, uh, you would need something like a Kramers chronic analysis to go from the imaginary part to the real part. So imaginary part is somehow more easy to measure with the other techniques, but the real part uh, of the dielectric function more complicated. Okay. Okay, then um... Oh, there is a question. Other question, yes. Yeah, so one question again uh, on this particular type of measurements uh, that we do in the instrumentary. Um, are there some uh, special reason for using this uh, instead of uh, other spectroscopy? Like you said, for thin films, but then for eels also, uh, if the sample thickness should be very small, no? So, what would be the thickness uh, ratio in uh, eels and uh, let's say? Um, uh, symmetry one because the goal of both of them are not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thin films is a very broad concept, so it depends what is thin for somebody. Uh, thin films uh, typically uh, grown on a substrate uh, using kind of a, uh, you, you have this in thin film laboratories where people characterize normally the film roughness and thickness. It's an optical light uh, tool, so you don't need electrons. You, ele electrons, you would need a slightly bigger equipment. Uh, and uh, and this um, this is in, works in transmission, so that your thin films in the ellipsometry are grown on a substrate, whereas say um, in a, in eels, uh, you, in, uh, normally people uh, do this in transmission, so you must prepare a very thin sample without the substrate. Um, there are thin for for thin film uh, studies. Uh, these are two completely different things. Okay, and then also in ellipsometry, we are measuring a uh, reflectance, no? Or reflectivity? Ellipsometry is measuring the reflectivity, yes. More something coming out of uh, the surface and not from the bulk. Yeah, but it's still uh, 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 photons, so it's uh, uh, it it will. So we'll see the uh, depend on the thickness of the film. Ideally, the uh, idea is to have the thin uh, film so thin that uh, you see the uh, the reflectivity uh, in, uh, interference also from the substrate, so that you can determine the film thickness. Or maybe you have a multilayer, and 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 then you can get something, some uh, information on the on the multilayer structure. So this is also used for maybe more standardly uh, as a uh, tool for characterization of the thin films rather than really measuring uh, the spectra. Uh, you know, some laboratories have uh, ellipsometry uh, devices that are only focusing to get a few points in energy and that's enough for them to say that what, uh, what, uh, what thickness, for example, the film is. But they are not really spectroscopy as such that you would beautifully map out uh, the uh, imaginary and real part of the dielectric function. Thank you. Okay. Another question? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Question. What is the physical meaning of the real part dielectric function? And can we measure it uh, experimentally? Yeah. So the question can is you... yeah, if the, 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 the I said the physical meaning of the, the electric function is actually the real and imaginary part. 
they are both measurable. Yes. So they are. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to uh, add something on the physical meaning, but essentially, in the, the dielectric function is the linear response function between an applied field and the total field. In some way, in the in the idea of the Maxwell equations, no. And they are measurable quantities, for example, via ellipsometry or via absorption coefficient. No? Well, in the absorption coefficient, like in the beer Lambert law, it's rather the imaginary part, right? Exactly, because yeah, that's the main physical difference is that the imaginary part uh, describes uh, attenuation. Uh, in classically, the, the uh, attenuation of the amplitude of the wave field inside a material that has a refractive index, okay? And then uh, the real part uh, measures the change of the phase. So that's why uh, explicitly the only the uh, imaginary part appears in the absorbance. And of course, the two are uh, very much related because of causality. Since uh, we have causality condition, we can only measure things after that we apply a source. Uh, they are related, and so there are the so-called Kramers chronic, that uh, knowing one, the real part or the vaginal part, you know automatically the others by doing this uh, Kramers chronic transformation. Yes, in principle, but for experimentalist point of view, it's uh, somehow difficult because you must measure, let's say, uh, from mi minus infinity to plus infinity, everything uh, without any uh, sources of error. And uh, typically because of um, you must truncate the data somehow uh, and then how to normalize it, uh, these things, uh, subtract background and so on, this might have a tremendous effect in the transformation. So it's not so easy uh, always. So that's why it's nice to have ellipsometry, which can measure both at the same time. Yeah, and actually related to that, for the, for the exercise, uh, for example, tomorrow, that we're gonna calculate the, uh, the electric function. Indeed, you are going to calculate the electric function automatic for the real and imaginary part, but you will choose a range. And there is a test in the code, in the DP code, that tells you, well, if I do the Kramer's chronic, for example, of the real part, but uh, only in that range that I calculate, and I transform it to obtain the imaginary part, how wrong am I? And you will see that uh, as Simo said, you can be really wrong because we are sampling, for example, between zero and 10 electron volt, then you fully transform, sorry, you cram a scrolling transform and you obtain the imaginary part and you are completely off. Normally you are only a few percent. You really need really a very large range in frequency to use the cram scrolling, but it's a tool. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Alan? At some point, you mentioned that uh, there are different platforms or separate platforms for layered and 2D systems. But uh, why is so? Only because of the anisotropy? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, at some point, you mentioned that there are separate platforms for layered and 2D systems. Uh, why is that? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, for example, if you have a system like uh, graphite or, or take a single graphene sheet, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the pi electrons and sigma electrons, and they have different, basically uh, different role. Uh, they have different, they are different parts of the band structure. They appear also uh, as different plasmons, basically, basically uh, because of uh, the different densities. So one can one can see the pi and the sigma plus mon separately. Can, can, you were talking about plasmon or platforms? No, plasmons. Okay. So in terms of plasmon, you also have some um, some uh, models in which you can uh, evaluate, for example, the bulk plasmon from the surface plasmon and vice versa, no? because they are related in the, in the Drude model, no? They are sort of related with, um, with a simple uh, square root of two ratio, right? Something like that, if I remember well. So we have more or less the idea of where the, uh, the range 
uh, it should be the range of energy in the plasma should be considering the electron density. If you are a 3D plasma or a 2D plasma. Yeah. Uh, how do we retrieve the green uh, green function and the self energy in the R plus measurement? How do we reach the? How do we retrieve? How do we find? Ah, the green's function from this experiment. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a long way, I guess. No. We're gonna see, let's say, the other way around, starting Wednesday. So we introduce the Green's function formalism, and we'll see how, for example, the imaginary part of the Green's function is related to the spectral function mentioned by Simo, and uh, how the uh, Two particles Green's function is related to, by a, a lot of averaging procedure, to the uh, dielectric function. Okay. It's not uh, something obvious that you say, okay, I have the experiment, and then from there you extract the Green's function. This is not, uh, because normally it's the other way around. The Green's function is a, a quantity that contains really a lot of information, is related to the many body states of the system, and then you average out, you do procedure, to connect to your uh, spectra and to obtain the spectrum. The other way around, you can have hints, of course. You're looking at the spectral function, you will have hints about uh, the, 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 the position of the peaks, for instance, that you would expect in your green function. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Simo told that the Ferrari experiment allows you to measure the real and the imaginary part, for example, the uh, ellipsometry. But uh, but about uh, the Green's function, I think that we can only experimentally measure the imaginary part. So to reconstruct the real part, uh, you should do the kramer kronig but uh, from infinity to infinity. And uh, as Simo told you, that's, uh, let's say every single uh, inaccuracy uh, accumulate and uh, your result is not uh, that correct. So I think that, uh, I, I don't know, I, uh, probably Simu is more expert than me, but I don't know any experimental technique that like elipsometry allows you to measure also the real part of the Green's function, just only the imaginary part. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, you're, you're right. It, it works the other way around. Normally from the experiment, you don't see it directly, but you see it as an effect uh on on the experimental spectra which means that you, you must start from a model and try to model the experiment as accurately as possible and then you compare whether you get the same result if you get the same result then you are happy if not then there's something wrong in the model or in the experiment i mean it could also <laughs> be that way around no i mean it's a uh, Usually you have uh, both approaches and, and then, then you start working from different directions and then you meet somewhere in the middle. So you, it's not uh, immediately always clear uh, what the spectro spectroscopy tells about the structure of materials. It's a, in, it's a little bit indirect probe, let's say. And, and the other importance of theory. That's the, that's that's the imp important importance of the theory and what that's why you are there and i i really hope that uh, this uh, school will be a, a very very useful i'm sure it will be i just googled out very quickly the uh i don't know if you see the screen here yeah. so this is from graphite you see two different uh, plasmons one is to the, the pi uh, uh, and one is to the pi plus uh, actually pi plus pi plus sigma basically classically one can think that these uh, these electrons have different uh, electron uh, gas density in a truth model like uh, like was mentioned and if you calculate then the dielectric function you can see that they have separate separate uh, structures uh, that come from uh, uh, from the different uh, different uh, types of uh, orbitals separately in the different places in energy. So this is why the plasmon has more structure than just being one peak. Uh, typically, uh, it it can tell you, for example, about the different dynamics uh, of of this uh, type of electron separately. This will be an important point when. Uh we tackle the GW and we want to use the plasmon pole model. And then we have to decide which plasmon we use for the plasmon pole model. 
So you can have more than one plasmonic peak. Okay, well, we are here at the pause now. So if there are no other. If there are questions of. Yeah, I don't have the chat. No, do you have the chat? No question from the online audience. Well, in that case, I would like to really thank uh, Simo for uh, intervening here and giving us uh, this, uh, this nice introduction. We will have a lot of uh, connection with your, um, with, your, uh, with your slides during the whole, uh, the whole uh, school, uh, because you mentioned essentially all the kind of spectroscopy we're gonna deal with from the theoretical point of view. Optical, electron energy loss, inelastic stress scattering, and photo emission. We're gonna do them, uh, uh, do them all. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure, and I hope to be there uh, next time in physically. <laughs> Good. Also, Thank you. We'll uh, be, of course, welcome to connect whenever you want, whenever you can during these mornings. We, you know that we only have the mornings you, in the hybrid. The afternoon session, the exercise session, will be only in presential. Here, we don't have any online. It will be very complicated. Okay, so time for pause. Thank you again.